America in Another World by Ron the Black Cat Chapter 61 Defense of Hawaii Part 2 0845 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC Time 0245 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii Time Air over the Pacific From the open bay doors in the center belly of each F-22 Raptor an AIM-120 AMROM dropped down. All the AMRAAMs propelled forwards at once with a blaze coming from each of their tails. Only a few seconds later, another AMROM dropped from each of the F-22s. It wasn't long before each Raptor expanded all six of their AMRAAMs in their central bay. 84 AMRAAMs streaked through the sky. A few minutes later, the 70 F-16s followed suit. Their AMROMs launched forwards from where they were situated under the wings of the F-16S. One after another, the missiles shot forward with a blaze. Each F-16 fired off their four AMRAAMs. A total of 280 AMRAAMs were fired from the F-16S. Break formation? Break formation. Evade? Evade. Because of the similarities between the description of the human weapon used to shoot down planes and the arrows fired from a bow and arrow, it was decided to dub them arrows. The once organized fleet of propeller aircraft started crisscrossing. They went in every direction in order to try to confuse the missiles. RA-189N dive bombers and RA-1 torpedo bombers started diving. The EA-192N fighters started turning left or right. The pilot of an RA-189N, Siveral Ralokan, put the nose of his plane down and followed the other RA-189NS. His backseat gunner, Camus Arara, panically shouted as he watched one of arrows curve towards them. Siveral, it's coming right for us? Change directions. The plane started banking left. Nonetheless, the arrow quickly gained on them. It's right in my fa. The arrow smashed right through the tail and exploded. It didn't take long before more of the arrows started hitting. It's turning towards me. I can't shake it off. It keeps follow. Protect the dive bombers. In the sky, elven aircraft burst into fireballs. Pieces of metal floated down from the orange, fiery explosions. Confused by the mass of crisscrossing planes, one or two of the arrows went off course. All others hit. The remaining elven aircraft got back into a few V formations. The commander of the air fleet had barely survived. No clear loss count yet. We still have more than 50 aircraft at least. Continue the assault. Do not back down. Understood. Lieutenant Colonel Alex Jackson, commander of the 199th Fighter Squadron, looked at his radar. We still have many survivors. 90 or so aircraft. Closing in on targets. A few minutes later, what seemed to be silver arrowheads were approaching them at incredible speeds. With their remaining targets getting closer and closer, each F-22 opened up both of their side bay doors. Fox 2. AIM-9 sidewinders flew out from the open side bays. Break. The Raptors flew towards the elven aircraft that were breaking formation. Sidewinders started hitting. An EA-192N that was banking left exploded as a sidewinder hit it. Its main body disappeared in the explosion and the wings fell out of the sky. All 28 sidewinders found their targets. Only 12 EA-192NS, 23 RA-189NS, and 19 RA-1S remained. We are about even in terms of numbers of fighters. Form up and engage. It wasn't clear who was giving orders since their commanders had already died but the elven pilots followed what was said. The EA-192NS started turning around. The 20mm M61A2 Vulcan rotary cannon on one of the F-22S opened up. It shredded one of the elven fighters. The F-22 banked left and avoided the debris from the destroyed fighter. The EA-192NS tried to get behind the F-22S but they were just too fast. An F-22 quickly turned and got behind one of the EA-192NS. There's a hum. The elf pilot stopped as he watched his fellow aircraft get hit and go down. His face was flushed with anger. Death to these humans. He banked his aircraft left and turned towards the F-22. Then he shook violently. 
His plane dipped towards the ground. He frantically looked back at his tail which was completely gone. He was so blinded by anger that he failed to notice an F-22 strafing his tail while flying by. The RA-189NS and RA-1S tried to get out of the dogfight but the F-22S quickly started pursuing and shooting them down. The remaining EA-192NS tried to get the F-22S off of them. A lone RA-189N flew in the sky, it had miraculously gotten out of the dogfight. The pilot, Ninlin Payton, got on his Magi radio. We were the only ones to escape. Orders have not changed. Continue assault and do not back down. A heavy silence fell for a few seconds. Ninlin turned to his backseat gunner, Ivasar Loreira. Anything behind us? Seems like they didn't follow us. Ninlin turned back to the front. Good we might have slip. Ivasar, facing the back of the aircraft, was scanning the sky. He noticed that Ninlin stopped his sentence midway. What's the matter? Ninlin didn't reply. The Ivasar looked behind him and towards Ninlin. Hey, N.I. Seems like a dive bomber. The 70 F-16S flew closer and closer to the single RA-189N. The lead F-16 opened fire with a single sidewinder. Ninlin gritted his teeth and started turning his plane towards the sea. It was too late. The sidewinder struck the canopy of his aircraft. It exploded and evaporated him and Ivasar. The F-22 Raptors turned and started to head back. 0911 April 15, 2020 C, Washington DC time. 0311 April 15, 2020 C, Hawaii time. Elvin Fleet. We lost all aircraft. A silence fell over the meeting room. A few of the elven naval officers were surprised. Admiral Vainery stood there quietly and expressionless. He had long expected the end result. After a moment of silence, he started giving out commands. Tell all remaining aircraft carriers to toss all torpedoes, bombs, and aviation fuel overboard. We don't have any use for them anymore. They are now just unneeded explosives that could set off if another arrow hit us. Washington, D.C. All enemy aircraft have been shot out of the sky. No loss from combat. A few of the people in the situation room started clapping. President Hayes interrupted it. Save your clapping for later. It ain't over till the fat lady sings. Give me a quick satrap on the naval engagement. The Navy is still firing their missiles and they are preparing another wave of F-18s. The missiles are having some trouble destroying what we believe to be the battleships. They have taken multiple hits and haven't sunk. However, we should be able to damage them enough to become inoperable. U.S. Fleet. We are detecting multiple submarines approaching. The 11 MH-60 RC Hawk on the USS John C. Stennis has been rotating in order to keep a constant eye for submarines. After a few hours of rotations, they have finally found the Elven submarine fleet. RUM-139 VL Ashrock missiles launched from the Ticonderoga-class cruisers and Arleigh Burke-class destroyers. Elven Fleet The Elven naval officer had grim faces as the damage report was given. The NN Zumler has been hit nine times. The crew has done emergency repairs but it is still limping. The NN Falcon has been hit five times. It has sustained some damage but nothing too detrimental. The NN Olahis and NN Karen have been hit four times. Not much damage reported for either of them. Our ship has been hit two times and miraculously is still afloat. It probably won't last another hit. A few cruisers and carriers have also already been hit but suffered nothing major. We have lost, so far, a total of a battleship, two fleet carriers, three light carriers, 56 destroyers, seven cruisers, and 10 submarines. The Elven naval officers, already shocked by the news of the loss of their entire air fleet, were further disheartened by the report. It was nearly half of their fleet. Admiral Vainery didn't seem phased by the report. We will continue heading for the area where the enemy fleet could be. Admiral, we will be destroyed before we even get there. Our air wing has been destroyed. We have lost almost half of our destroyers, cruisers, and aircraft carriers. We need a new strategy. Should we try to split apart so they can't all target us at one location? 
Admiral Vainery shook his head. Even if we run now, the humans can still destroy us. The chances of us surviving were dismal from the start. The only path we have now is forward. Skies over the Pacific. And Rum 139 streaked through the sky. Then, a MK-54 torpedo dropped into the ocean from it. Multiple other Rum 139s were right behind it. S-89. The captain of the S-89 had been constantly checking in on his UMWE operator. He was scared of a repetition of the last attack. Anything on the UMWE. All is clear. And then something shook the submarine. What's that? A few minutes later, the Magi radio officer shouted. Report? S-23 has been hit. Another explosion shook the submarine. We are under attack. Even more explosions started. Elven fleet. On the deck of the NN Conqueror, torpedoes and bombs were pushed over and splashed into the sea. Report? Our submarines are under attack by torpedoes. Are they the same ones we experienced before? No sir, they explode on contact like normal torpedoes. S-89. The S-89 shook violently as something hit and exploded on it. We are taking on water? We are taking on water. Surface? Surface? Surface. We can't, sir. We are taking on too much water. Slowly, the S-89 sunk into the bottom of the sea. 0845 April 15, 2020 CE. 0722 Sun 15, 2020 CE. Near the Magus Imperium. Ashrak missiles were also being fired from the Arli Burks and Ticonderogas that were guarding the five aircraft carriers. The elves seem to be increasing their submarine patrols. They probably know where we are at now. I'm surprised that there's not a bigger response. I think they sent most of their forces to attack the west coast. The American fleet near the Magus Imperium was preparing to start the air campaign against the elven homeland. Chapter 62, Defense of Hawaii Part 3, 1032 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC Time. 0432 April 15, 2020 C, Hawaii time. Somewhere in the Pacific. Sitting on his bed, Admiral Vainery looked at the grey metal ceiling of his room. He had returned to his quarters for a short break. He could still hear the shouts of his ship's crew. He whispered to himself as if in a daze. I already quit, my leader. A few more minutes passed before he stopped looking at the wall and got up. He opened the door and walked into the brig. His officers immediately came up to him. Admiral, the NN Zumler has been sunk after 17 hits. We have to find a way to attack them. Admiral, what do we do? With the ever-diminishing number of ships, the battleships have placed themselves on the sides of the flagship, the NN Conqueror, in order to prevent it from being hit more. Suddenly, Admiral Vainery had the air knocked out of him as his chest and face slammed into the floor. He got up on all fours, winced, and started coughing. Soon, sounds of panic started around him. We have been hit. We have been hit. There's damage to the bottom right compartments of the ship. What happened to the battleships? Weren't they supposed to protect us? The NN Valken has been sunk. Admiral, are you all right? With the help of one of his officers, Admiral Vainery staggered up on his feet while still coughing. I'm, fine. After composing himself, Admiral Vainery walked to the windows of the brig as his officers scrambled to assess the damage. Slowly turning his head from the left to the right, he took in the carnage. The light from the moon and the ship fires provided a clear view. Smoke billowed out from the battleships as multiple fires raged. A cruiser was slowly sinking into the sea. Its front end was halfway in the ocean and its back jutted out in the air. Some elves jumped into the ocean from the sinking cruiser while others on it boarded lifeboats. Tiredness washed over him. Admiral Vainery took off his naval cap and placed it on the ledge of the window. He sighed. I'm stepping down from my position as admiral. There is nothing I can do at this point. Just let an old elf die quietly. Vainery turned and left. The officers watched with wide eyes as the admiral walked out of the door. Pandemonium ensued. What do we do? Who's in command now? Vice Admiral, what do we do? The Vice Admiral looked around at all the panicked officers. 
calm down, we still have a fleet to command. Then a report from one of the crew further shocked them. Report? The repair crews are unable to fix the damage caused by the last hit. We are taking on water. There was a heavy and panicked knocking on Vainery's door. Vainery felt exasperated. He had already told them that he quit. He wondered if they were just like Terran. Admiral, the ship is sinking. The damage from the last hit was too large to be contained. I told you already. I'm not the Admiral anymore. But Ad, sir, the ship is sinking. We have to evacuate. I may not be the Admiral anymore but I was only a few minutes ago. I will go down with my ship. Washington, D.C. President Hayes looked somewhat nervously at the screen. They have set their course directly for Hawaii. We must stop them here and now. Secretary of Defense Krilson rubbed his chin. We are trying. We have destroyed a majority of their fleet but their battleships are still there. Under current calculations, it should be impossible for them to reach Hawaii before being completely wiped out. Still, their battleships are quite a nuisance. With enough harpoon missiles, they will sink, eventually. President Hayes closed his eyes and nodded as if coming to a decision. We will need to make some changes soon. Somewhere in the Pacific, Seaman Joe Bennington watched as missile after missile was launched. In his entire time of service so far, he had never seen so many launches happening without stopping. Streaks of smoke that blanketed the night sky were illuminated every time a missile was launched. The blazing fire of a missile coming out of its tube in the middle of the night always seemed beautiful to him. 1032 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0516 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Oceans near the Magus Imperium. Rear Admiral, Lower Half, Halbert Johnson, in command of the USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group, viewed the deck of his aircraft carrier. Admiral, the entire surrounding area should be clear. Nothing is coming up on the radar. Good. Make sure it stays that way. They had already engaged multiple submarine and destroyer patrols. The fleet sent to clear the seas near the Magus Imperium had suffered little to no damage whilst inflicting heavy casualties on the elves. Seems like the amphibious assault ships are arriving. Magus Imperium. Isaac sat down on a rock near the beach. His squadmates were loitering around. In front of them, bulldozers and diggers were piling up dirt. Engineers were setting up the buildings and infrastructure. In their haste to retreat from the Magus Imperium, the elves were unable to destroy everything. The most important structure of all to the Americans were the ports that the elves had been building in order to transport in new supplies and units. The Army Corps of Engineers was now busy modernizing the ports that the elves had left behind. In preparation for D-Day 2, it was vital that these ports were able to accommodate a large bulk of the U.S. Army and Navy. Most of the U.S. Army was already located in the Magus Imperium so it made much more sense to use these ports to invade the Elf's homeland. 1052 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. Time. 0452 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii Time. Somewhere in the Pacific, the NN Conqueror started listing to the side. Objects in Vainery's room started sliding forward. Shouts of his last remaining sailors could still be heard as they ran to board the lifeboats. A knock sounded on his door. Vainery felt annoyed. What? Sir, are you sure you don't want to evacuate? I have already said so. I will go down with my ship. There was a short silence before the elf behind the door spoke. Understood, sir. The room had been tilted to an extreme degree but Vainery could still sit on his bed. Water started seeping in through the bottom of the door. He sighed. I should have stayed home. The survivors on the lifeboats watched as the NN Conqueror was slowly enveloped by water. On the NN Olahis, the survivors climbed out of their lifeboats and were helped onto the ship. The officers of the NN Conqueror also gathered there since it seemed the safest. The NN Olahis was the least damaged out of all the remaining battleships. It had only been hit six times. In the brig, the officers bickered about their next step. I propose that we retreat. Retreating will bring shame on the Navy. Then what do you want us to do? 
just continue straight to our deaths? We are doing nothing more than walking off a cliff at this point. I already brought up the idea. We should split our forces so the humans can't target us all. Being in one blob is making us easy prey. I have no idea why the Admiral didn't allow us to do this. A few minutes later, the remaining ships in the Elven fleet all started moving apart. Ships in the center continued forward while the ones on the right and left flanks turned towards their direction. The missiles being fired were almost all Ashrak missiles. A seemingly endless stream of Elven submarines was showing up on radar. Los Angeles-class submarines had also gotten within range and were firing their torpedoes. S-57 The 7th submarine flotilla has faced heavy casualties. S-22 has been sunk. S-156 has been sunk. S-74 has been sunk. S-80 has be. An endless report of losses came streaming in. The captain bit his finger. He screamed in frustration. Have we found their ships yet? No, Captain. We are being shot out like literal fishes in a barrel. We have no idea where they are firing from but they seem to know perfectly where we are. Somewhere in the Pacific. The officers of the NN Conqueror looked at each other hostilely. They are still sinking us? Splitting up didn't do anything to help. In fact, it might have worsened it. The three groups have been moving farther and farther apart from each other but the attacks still continued on all of them. Then, another explosion rocked the NN Olahis. Objects started sliding to the right. Although it started off minor, there now was an obvious listing to the right. Abandoned ship? We are sinking. One of the officers slammed his fist on the table. A few minutes later, we don't have any ships left. On the lifeboat, the elves watched as the NN Olahis quickly toppled to the right. Its tower splashed into the ocean and the keel could be seen out of the water. Before long, it was completely upside down and quickly submerging. Now only debris and the wide expanse of the ocean surrounded them. Not a single warship was in sight. Washington, D.C. All enemy surface vessels have been destroyed. There are still a few remaining groups of submarines but I can almost confidently declare that we have prevented the elves from reaching Hawaii or doing any major damage. President Hayes started clapping. In a flash, everyone was cheering and applauding in the Situation Room. A bit premature but it has been a stressful few hours for everyone. S-57 a Magi radio operator who had been trying to contact the surface fleet for the last 20 minutes looked back at his captain. We have lost all contact with the main fleet. They are lost aren't they? The captain knew that the surface fleet had been taking a beating. He didn't expect them to be destroyed so fast. Give me the Magi radio. I need to directly talk with the commanders of the other submarines. The Magi radio operator handed it over to him. I would like the attention of all flotilla commanding officers. The S-57 was the flagship submarine of the entire submarine fleet that was present. The surviving commanders or lieutenant commanders of the various submarine flotillas that made up the fleet acknowledged Captain Oloris. With deep consideration of the mounting losses and having no clear picture of where the enemy is, I have decided to announce a complete retreat. If you have any opposition to this, Please speak up now. None of the commanders opposed. Having already lost a total of around 50 submarines, each surviving flotilla had already been heavily battered. Chapter 63, Mop Up. 1138 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0538 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Hawaii. Their submarine fleet is turning around. Cheers rose in the brig of the USS John C. Stennis. Rear Admiral Kirkland smiled. Mission accomplished everyone. Although the elves were retreating, Ashrock missiles were still being fired. The streaks of smoke from the missiles could clearly be seen as the day started to brighten. The tip of the sun was barely peeking out of the horizon. Somewhere in the Pacific, multiple RHIBs sped across the ocean. Large wakes formed behind them. An MH-60S flew over them and headed towards the same direction. A few more MH-60SS followed behind. The lead helicopter came upon a bunch of wooden lifeboats. Whilst keeping a distance, 
They hovered. You are being rescued. Do not resist. We are here to help. Under the gene. The announcer stopped for a second. Realizing his mistake, he coughed before continuing. Under the oath of the government of the United States, you will be treated humanely as prisoners of war. One of the MH-60s started lowering itself at one of the lifeboats. An elf on the lifeboat stuck his hand out towards the sea. A small blob of water rose out of the sea and the elf swung his hand at the MH-60s. The blob of water flew towards the helicopter and stuck it. It shook a bit from the impact. Ah oh, fuck. They are shooting at us. Abort. Abort. More and more elves stuck their hands out at the water. The MH-60S quickly started pulling back up as more blobs of water started hitting it. The water was hitting so hard that it sounded like the ricochets of bullets. After returning back to its original position, the firing stopped. They are shooting at us with their magic. Understood. Give them a warning. The elves in the lifeboat cheered as the MH-60S backed away. The elves started hollering at the helicopters. Get out of here you inferiors. I repeat we are here to rescue you. We have no intent on harming anyone. You will be treated humanely. A few of the elves tried to hit the helicopters with their water bullets but they lacked the range to do so. They soon stopped firing and started rowing their lifeboats. Washington DC. Krilson gave a suggestion after learning that the elves were firing at the rescue helicopters. If they continue resisting we will probably need to shoot them. President Hayes raised an eyebrow. Won't that be considered a war crime? War crimes aren't important in this world anymore. I'm pretty sure the word war crimes doesn't even exist in this world. We will probably face no international backlash for what we do. Okay, but what I meant was public perception. We should be asking whether or not the American people will be outraged by our actions. And I don't believe the public would approve. It will definitely seem like we are shooting defenseless people in the waters. The media will have a heyday with that. It's domestic backlash that's important now. But Mr. President, we can't just leave them there. We can't let them land in Hawaii. They are clearly rowing towards Hawaii. They will endanger people if they land. The president couldn't respond. He sat there in deep thought. Tell the commanding officer to threaten them but don't actually shoot them. Let's see what happens. Somewhere in the Pacific. Only the sound of the blades could be heard as the MH-60SS hovered in the sky. I repeat. Continued resistance will be met with deadly force. The lead MH-60S lowered itself once again and once again. The elves shot at it. Washington, D.C. The rear admiral is asking whether or not he has permission to shoot. He doesn't sound too happy about us telling him what to do. Well I'm the commander-in-chief and it's my reputation on the line here. Are the RHIBs armed? The personnel on them are. The RHIBs themselves aren't. Then instruct the MH-60 to fire warning shots at the elves. If the RHIBs are shot at when they arrive, then they can return fire with intent to kill. Somewhere in the Pacific. The .50 cal on the open side door of the MH-60S opened up in a few quick bursts. Small amounts of water sprouted up close to the elven boats as the bullets hit the water. Boats are here to pick you up. If they are shot at, we will use deadly force. The RHIBs quickly came into view. The elves are not cooperating. We have fired warning shots. Try getting closer. Weapons hold. Stay frosty. Over. This is Dolphin 1. Heard you loud and clear. Out. They are opening fire. The sailors on the RHIBs ducked as water bullets whizzed over them. The single .50 calories on the side door of the MH-60SS opened up at the boats. The sailors on the RHIBs started firing their rifles at the elves. Water sprouted up as .50 caliber bullets hit the ocean. Holes were punctured through the elves' wooden boats. The elves tried to shoot back with water bullets but were being quickly cut down. The sheer volume of fire terrified the elves. Some of the lifeboats started taking on water and sinking. A couple of elves jumped into the water in a desperate attempt to survive. Many dead elves floated on the ocean but there were still many boats afloat. The elves who survived started raising their hands in surrender. 
A few minutes later, get them on the boat. Don't let your guards down. Their literal hands are weapons. Don't hesitate to shoot if you see them lift their arms. An RHIB got up next to one of the elf lifeboats. One by one, the sailors dragged the elves onto the RHIB. Every time an elf was helped on, at least four M4 rifles were aimed at them. The sailors had their fingers on the trigger and were ready to shoot at a moment's notice. The other RHIBs and MH60SS all had their guns trained on the other lifeboats. Each of the elves' hands was zip-tied as hard as possible to prevent movement. Petty Officer, 3rd Class, Dan Haley did a quick sweep of the elves being rescued. We captured quite a few of them alive. I thought they were all suicidal. 1120 April 15, 2020 CE, 0540 Sun 15, 196 A, of Valen, Elven Nation. Our assault fleet has failed and the Americans have pushed us out of the seas near the Magus Imperium. Terran slammed his fist on his table. It seems like the Navy can no longer protect us. How is the defense construction going? Terran's advisor stayed silent for a second. My leader, wouldn't you like to know about the condition of the assault fleet? Terran raised his eyebrows. There are still survivors. Yes, about 30 or so submarines. They are being pursued and attacked. The Navy is trying to save them. Terran waved him off. That's the Navy's concern now, not mine. I want to know how our defense situation is. Well, we have hidden hundreds of tanks, dug thousands of miles of trench line, placed down thousands of mines, and anti-aircraft guns blanket the land. We also have large weapon stocks ready to be handed out. What about the PAMs? I'm sorry, what? Terran looked a bit irritated. The portable anti-magi panzers. The advisor flipped through the papers on his clipboard. Those are, uh, under mass production and will be available soon. 1153 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0553 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Somewhere in the Pacific, an MH60R flew swiftly through the sky. It was on a search and destroy mission. Near the left side door of the helicopter, there are multiple evenly spaced holes. A sonobuoy popped out from one of these holes and splashed into the ocean. We have found multiple submarines miles in front of our position. We'll be engaging. How copy? Over. Solid copy. You are free to engage. Out. On each side of the very small stub wings of the helicopter, there was an MK-54 lightweight torpedo. It launched both. The other MH-60Rs were speeding to the location. 1210 April 15, 2020 CE. 0605 Sun 15, 196 A. Somewhere in the Magus Imperium. An American engineer got out of the M4 Sherman. Congratulations on your first M4 Sherman. Seeing that you followed the manual to a T, there should be no issues with it. Empress Arstant nodded with an impressed look on his face. Compared to the clanky-looking and riveted Magasian Magi tanks, the M4 Shermans had much smoother armor. Good? Very good? I like it. I do recommend you test fire it though. I'm an engineer so I don't actually know if you made the ammunition correctly. The gun is made correctly though. Asta Air Base, Magus Imperium. Get the papers loaded. Originally a small airbase with a bumpy runway that accommodated the wyverns of the Magus, the airbase had gotten larger and larger ever since the arrival of the Americans. There was now even a brownstone sign right outside of the base with the white words U.S. Air Force and Asta Air Base right under it. It was located next to the small town of Asta and right behind the massive Zaytha jungle that cuts through the Magus Imperium. Large containers of papers were stacked into the C-130. The sound of more and more planes landing could be easily heard. Various units have already been stationed at the Asta Air Base. 1302 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. Washington DC. President Hay had a busy day ahead of him. He had spent most of the morning keeping a close eye on the situation near Hawaii. Now with that over, he still had to deal with the affairs of the rest of the day. 
He sat down in his chair in the Oval Office and rifled through his presidential daily brief. A knock came on the door. Come in Krilson. What did you want to talk about? On his way to return to his office, Krilson had urgently told him that he had a very important message. Well, it seems like the Magus wants to cooperate with us in the invasion. I don't see why not. They have been quite useful in the past and we just gave them Sherman's and P-51 Mustangs. I really don't think we need to do a joint offensive. It would just be too big of a headache and I don't really trust the capabilities of the Magus. Well, we have the technological capabilities while the Magus has the numerical one. There have been circumstances where the Magus have been quite helpful with their numbers. Chapter 64, Around the World 0923 April 17, 2020 CE, Washington DC It was morning but President Hay still felt a bit worn out because of the constant reports and briefings. The Green Berets have reported that there are multiple human concentration camps scattered across the Elven Nation. We are currently pouring through satellite photography in order to try and locate them. What are the chances that we will have a massacre on our hands if we start D-Day 2? The military analysts have described it as too much for comfort. Then devise a plan to get them out of there. The invasion will still proceed on the same day. 0904 April 17, 2020 CE. 0732 Sun 17, 196 AE. Primo Polis, Magus Imperium. Here are the main stipulations. You will provide your own vessels to transport your invasion force. We do not have enough to accommodate you. However, our navy will protect your transports. You will have independent control of your units but you will have to cooperate with our officers. Our officers will also have the final say on decisions. We expect humane treatment of the elves who surrender. We do not condone the killing of non-combatants. And we expect your soldiers to act civilized. More detailed information would be in the document that I have given to you. Emperor Arstand nodded as he schemed through the document. I see. Then how will we divide up the land? The American ambassador to the Magus Imperium, Jimmy Manning, looked at the emperor with questioning eyes. It's a small continent. We suspect that they have a lack of resources because our scientists have noticed that the compositions of their armor are not entirely made of metal. The elves seem to be trying to make up for this lack of resources by using magic. So what is your country planning to do then once you have defeated the elves? We will just occupy and install a democratic government before leaving. Are you willing to leave some land for us then? Our policy is a period of occupation while reforming their government. If you are invading with intentions of doing a land grab, then we will pull out all support. Emperor Arstand seemed to be fuming. You are just going to let them go after all they have done. My nation has suffered the most out of this invasion, I would like them to give us some land. Isn't this how it usually goes? When a nation loses a war it has to cede some of its lands to the victor. Your words are utterly ridiculous. Have you not seen what happened? The towns and cities in the northern regions of my country have been reduced to nothing. My entire navy is nearly gone. Hundreds and thousands of my soldiers and civilians have lost their lives. We understand this. However, taking their land will do you no benefit. There seems to be nothing there that you can exploit. You are allowed to calculate the damage and ask the elves for war reparations. We will see to it that they pay you. However, the US will never condone the annexation of their sovereign territory. We will also not condone any acts of revenge. Do not raise their cities and towns or start massacres. Emperor Arstant had an extremely displeased look on his face. Jimmy stood there for a bit as the emperor thought in silence. Minutes passed by, I will give you time to consider. Jimmy started to walk out. Halfway to the door, he stops and looks back. Remember that without our help, your nation would be at their mercy of the elves right now. Do not consider this a slight. These words are just the mere truth and you know it. Jimmy opened the door and got out. 1055 April 17th 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. Krilson sat down in a meeting with Hay. I will get it to you straight. 
I still don't like the idea that you are permitting the Magasians to come along. We already have our hands full trying to calm one shrieking baby. We don't need another baby that is liable to fall face first onto the ground. President Hay chuckled a bit. Are you seriously describing countries as babies? It's a metaphor. I am seriously exasperated by your decision, you know. President Hay pointed at Krilson. Look Krilson. You have to see it from my point of view. You are a military leader. I'm a civilian one. I know not having the Magus come with us would make the invasion much easier to plan out and execute. But we are a country that is literally alone in this world. We need to form diplomatic relationships. Sure, we have the BAME and Mach, but they are just countries under our occupation. Other than that, the countries of the Soana League are quite bound to the Magus Imperium. Their opinion of us and centuries of relations with the Magus won't change with just a few mercenaries. 1100 April 17, 2020 CE. 0830 Sun 17, 196 AE. Magus Imperium. Their roads are complete shit. At least the Machians had actual paved roads and metal bridges. An Abrams driver got out of his tank. The tracks of his Abrams were filled with dirt and mud was smudged on all sides of the tank. Well, command sent us through the Bunas. The main paths have paved roads and metal bridges. That can't even be considered the Bunas. We passed through a lot of towns. Even in the Machian forests, they actually have paved roads instead of just muddy dirt roads and metal bridges instead of rickety century-old wooden ones. What the fuck is wrong with this country's infrastructure? Seeing that this is a magic country, I guess they didn't really embrace the Industrial Revolution. Well, their magic is still shit either way. Heard some talk about the magic hybrid engines of the Magus to be inferior to the mechanical ones that the Mach have. With the number of American vehicles moving towards the southern tip of the Magus Imperium and the undeveloped infrastructure of the Magus Imperium, a lot of issues have started to pop up. Of Valen, Elven Nation. Pablo looked at his team who were gathered in his hotel room. Although we were originally going to stay here and keep surveillance until right before the airstrikes started, we have a change of plans. We got orders from the top. We need to search for human concentration camps. Especially those in heavily wooded areas. Hmm, well, all the recent newspapers mention human concentration camps but not exactly where they are. Can't we go to where the slave auctions are being held and follow one of their trucks until it leads us to one? Well, that will only help us locate one. It has been confirmed that the elves have multiple concentration camps. Satellites already found and confirmed too. They are the more visible ones. There are also multiple possible ones. Satellite footage picked up trucks carrying humans into a few different forests. However, the satellites were not able to locate the exact locations of the concentration camps. That's our job. Then what is the plan? We will split into teams of two, six teams. Each team will be assigned to sectors of the forests to comb through. Remember don't take any actions. We are only here right now to scout them out. Understood. Yes, sir. 0224 April 18th, 2020 CE. 0412 Sun 18th 196 AE. Magus Imperium. A kid ran out of his house and waved at the American tanks passing by. The commanders, who had their hatches open and their heads out of the tank, waved back. Mom? Mom? Look? Tanks. Arthur get back in here. The mother ran out of the house and guided her child back towards the house. She flashed a fake smile towards the Americans and quickly closed the door. Inside the house, the boy looked down at his shoes as he was scolded. They are foreigners? They aren't us. Arthur. We can't trust people who aren't like us. You don't know what they could do to you. Ignore them and hide. I don't want to see you running to them ever again. Do you understand? While his eyes were still looking at the ground, he quietly replied. Understood. A lot of the Magasian civilians were quite welcoming of them. They sometimes came out in masse to cheer as American troops and vehicles rolled by. Sometimes, it felt like a parade. They were very thankful for the American help against the elves. But that doesn't mean they were all like that. 
Some people have given them the stink eye. There were also a couple of places where the overall air felt unwelcome. This was one of the places. The inhabitants of the village had shut their doors and closed their curtains as the Americans came through. 1124 April 18, 2020 CE, Nashville, Tennessee. Jack set down his groceries. He peeled open an orange and started snacking on it. He really wanted to eat an apple right now but they weren't in season. A lot of fruits and vegetables weren't in season during this time of the year for the U.S. In the old world, fruits and vegetables were in season year-round because of imports. Steps have been taken by companies to make something similar in this world but it had been disrupted by politic and the recent war. What's even more annoying to John was the lack of a lot of products. Quite a lot of those products had made in China stuck onto them in the old world. Companies tried to make up for this vacancy by ramping up production. However, this caused a labor shortage. Not everyone wanted to work in a factory. Some companies have already opened up factories in the Mach and BAME. Quite a lot are still waiting for permission to do so. 1144 April 18, 2020 CE 0822 Sun 18, 196 AE Port City of Yalin, Elven Nation In the port, civilians murmured in worry amongst themselves. Many had seen the returning military transport vessels and wanted to cheer for the returning soldiers. A crowd had formed right outside of the port. What greeted them wasn't an army filled with victory but a seemingly exhausted and demoralized one. They speculated about what had happened. Were they defeated? No way, maybe they are just the injured coming back. That seems to make sense. Ten days later, Lorson Kelfer sat down and drank his morning tea. His eyes skimmed through the newspaper he was holding with his free hand. It detailed another glorious victory that they have had. The last of his doubts washed away as he read it. When he saw so many returning exhausted soldiers in the port, he feared that they had been defeated. Now he believes that the fear was unfounded. Fifteen days later, Narman Temporary Air Base, Magus Imperium, F-15S and F-16S were scattered across the temporary air base. Inside a hastily erected building, men of the 1st Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment checked over their equipment. Four MC-130 aircraft were parked right outside. Asta Air Base, Magus Imperium. B-52S taxied down the runway. B-1BS prepared to do so as well. Chapter 65, Operation Firestorm Part 1. 2306 April 18, 2020 CE. 0233 Sun 19, 196 AE. Port City of Yalin, Elven Nation. Era looked at the ceiling in her bedroom. Being a major general had its perks. It meant that she had her own personal room in the barracks. She thought over what had happened when she got back. The moment they had gotten off of their ships, they all were escorted away. Here, being a major general also had its downsides. It meant that she was grilled for information for hours on end and had to recount her entire experience from beginning to end. Then she was warned that revealing anything about the defeats was treason. Of course, this also applied to everyone else as well. She sighed and got off of the bed. She muttered to herself. I wonder if they have any leaf juice left in the cafeteria. 0844 May 13, 2020 CE. 0722 Sun 43rd. 196 A. Yale Leon Forest, Elven Nation. In the bushes, Pablo stared at the camp through his binoculars. Fences surrounded the entire place. Elves armed with bolt-action rifles walked around the perimeter. There were sniper towers placed at the corners. Although he didn't spot any, he wouldn't be surprised if there were machine gun nests. Dennis whispered to him. This is the what? Third one we found. Yap. So far we got a total of 12 of them, some smaller than the others. Hmm. Invasion should be starting soon. Weren't we supposed to monitor the situation in the capital? Saving people is much more important. We will be rendezvousing with the others soon. We got orders to take one of the smaller concentration camps once the birds have flown. Dennis nodded and grunted in acknowledgement. 
Pablo did one last scan of the fenced area. Let's go. Crouching low, they quietly walked back into the dense forest. Beaches of the Magus Imperium. Nix M1A1 Abrams got onto the USS Bonhomme Richard. The tank lurched forward before coming to a stop. Damn it Connolly, you nearly rammed us into the ship. Slow down. Sorry about that. Dillian and Brian laughed. Nick sighed. Isaac sat around doing particularly nothing. The construction of the temporary ports has been mostly finished. The Marines were going to be the ones to clear the beach so he wasn't part of the first wave. He wondered how his wife and kids were doing back home. 2324 May 13, 2020 CE, 0242 Sun 44, 196 AE, Norman Temporary Air Base, Magus Imperium. At early dawn with the sun barely up, a company-sized element of the 1st Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, around 200 men, loaded onto the 4MC-130J Commando IIS. In other air bases, other Ranger Regiments and Special Force teams got onto their MC-130JS. Washington, D.C. The air campaign will begin in the next hour. The Special Forces units have already taken off. President Hay stared at his water. Chief of Staff John Wills interrupted his staring contest. Mr. President. Ah, sorry. It's nearly midnight. The President rubbed his eyes and gave a sigh. 0030 May 14, 2020 CE. 0315 Sun 44, 196 AE. Asnthas Temporary Air Base. One by one, an entire squadron of F-35S took off. All of them carried AGM-88G Army RS, anti-radiation missiles capable of locking onto radar signals. Southern Sector Elven Detection Station. Senior Lieutenant Theodas Trizimyar yawned as he walked into the detection room while sipping on his tea. Multiple elves had headphones on and were staring at screens. He looked around and found Lieutenant Folas Joyaris. Anything on the muds of MWEs. Nothing out of the usual. Well just tell everyone to keep a lookout. I got orders that there might be unusual activity and to report absolutely anything. Well, we'll do, Theodas. Theodas walked out of the room, still holding on to his drink. Even though he just woke up, he decided to go take a nap. Being in charge of the detection station meant a dead end to his military career. However, he didn't really care. Most of the time, he got to do whatever he wanted. He was just getting paid to do almost nothing. Skies over the ocean between Magus Imperium and Elven Nation. No luck. We aren't getting anything. RT Bing. The squadron of F-35S all started banking to their left to turn back. Washington DC. There seems to be a slight issue. President Hay furrowed his eyebrows at those words. What happened? The anti-radiation missiles aren't locking on. The elves either don't have radar or their detection technologies are different from ours. Seeing that the elves are capable of long-distance command and that we have images of what we believe to be radar, I'm betting that their detection technology is different. Probably based on magic. That would explain why our jammers seemingly didn't work on affecting the elves' combat capabilities. Then why weren't they able to detect our stealth aircraft if they aren't using radar to detect things? They probably operate under the same principle as normal radars. Some sort of energy bouncing off an object. The F-35 and F-22 are shaped and painted to lessen the amount of energy that is bounced off. On the other hand, jammers and anti-radiation missiles depend on the emissions of the radar. Okay, then what should we do now? Their radar will be an issue. The old-fashioned way I guess. Drop a cluster bomb on it. We will most likely have to delay the start of the operation for about 30 minutes. 0102 May 14, 2020 CE. 0331 Sun 44, 196 AE. Asnthas Temporary Air Base, Magus Imperium. This time, the squadron of F-35S carried MK.20 Rakai 2 cluster bombs. They were also accompanied by F-22S as an escort. Norman Temporary Air Base, Magus Imperium. 
Only a few minutes after the takeoff of the F-35S and F-22S, squadrons of F-15S and F-16S took off from their runways. First Lieutenant Scott Miller got into his F-15E Strike Eagle. He looked back at his weapons system officer, Gerald Wallace. Ready. Gerald gave him a thumbs up. Asta Air Base, Magus Imperium. B-52S and B-1BS took to the skies. Multiple C-130S followed right after. Afinor Human Concentration Camp, Elven Nation. A guard blankly stared at the forest. His mind was wandering around. Inside a building in the camp, shouts from other elves could be heard amidst the noise of machinery. What are you stopping for? An elf officer looked angrily at a human man who had a dazed look on his face and was sitting with his back on the wall. Please sir, I'm too tired. Can I? The elf officer pulled out his pistol from his side holster and shot him in the head. The human collapsed face first in the ground. The officer looked around at the other humans in the factory. They had all stopped their work and were staring at the commotion. Anybody who stops like this human will be shot. The officer walked away. Although the humans didn't understand him, they understood what he meant. The elf guards inside the factory whispered to each other. What's this? The sixth one he shot? A eh, bunch of inferiors. Can't even work like the cattle they are. In the forest, Pablo surveyed the area with his binoculars. The rest of his team sat quietly behind him. We have a few guards at the gate. I can see two sniper towers from here. We'll need to neutralize all of them. Good thing that factory there is making a lot of noise. 150 miles off of the coast of the Elven Nation. A massive carrier strike group that consisted of the USS Gerald R. Ford, USS Harry S. Truman, USS Theodore Roosevelt, USS Ronald Reagan, and USS Abraham Lincoln moved slowly through the ocean. Rear Admiral, Upper Half, Jacob Brown approached the commander of the entire five-carrier carrier strike group. Admiral, the Air Force birds have flown. It's about time that ours did as well. Vice Admiral Angela Walters nodded at his deputy's reminder. Get the Super Hornets in the air. Rear Admiral, lower half, Halbert Johnson watched the deck as F-A-18 Super Hornets, loaded with harpoon missiles, launched off of the USS Abraham Lincoln. 0137 May 14, 2020 CE. 0348 Sun 44, 196 AE. Southern Sector Elven Detection Station. Theodas blearily opened his eyes. Rubbing his head for a bit, he got out of bed and decided to check on his men. Scratching his head, he went up to Fola's. Anything so far? Fola's grunted a single word. Usual. In the air. F-35S swooped down towards their target. A massive system of radar towers and stations was in front of them. Southern Sector Elven Detection Station. Suddenly, one of the operators popped up. Sir, we got something. That got Theodos' attention as his eyes shot up. Hmm, where is it? Right on top of us. What? At that moment, multiple explosions ripped apart the station. In the air. Target neutralized. RT Bing. While the F-35S quickly swung around, the F-22S kept moving forward. Ten minutes later. Nace Ankalen Air Base. An elf mechanic, Volman Chehorn, whistled as he tended to an EA-192. In the air, a squadron of EA-192s flew in formation. Suddenly an explosion made him stop what he was doing. Volman looked around fearing that someone had accidentally dropped a bomb while carrying it. Sweeping his eyes from right to left, he saw a few elves point up at the sky. He looked up just in time for another explosion to occur. This time he saw one of the flying EA-192s burst into flames. The sirens of the airbase blared. Volman quickly hastened his work and started skimming through all the unchecked parts. A squadron of EA-192s lined up on the runway and got ready. Quickly finishing, Volman shouted for someone to help him. He looked outside. The propellers of the EA-192s on the runway started spinning. Hey, this one is fixed. I need some people to help me get this outside. Two elves came running towards him. 
Just as the first aircraft were about to take off, a few massive explosions rocked the runway. The force of the explosion knocked the two elves off the ground. The runway was completely cratered and the aircraft that had attempted to take off were turned into metal charcoal. More explosions started blanketing the airbase. Volman quickly dived under a table. In the sky, Scott looked out of his F-15E Strike Eagles and down at the Elf airbase. Dark plumes of smoke rose to the sky, his plane turned around after the strike. At many other Elven air bases, similar situations occur. 150 miles off of the coast of the Elven nation. From the Tomahawk cruise missiles launched from every ship capable of doing so, white streaks trailed behind each Tomahawk. Angela was watching the spectacle when Jacob came up to her. The Super Hornets are about to reach their targets. Chapter 66, Operation Firestorm Part 2, 0155 May 14, 2020 CE, 0357 Sun 44, 196 AE. Port City of Elysory, Elven Nation. At this point, the size of the National Navy could be considered pitiful. It had been reduced to barely 30% of its size since the start of the war. With their consistent failures, they have fallen out of grace with Terran. Three battleships, an aircraft carrier, two cruisers, and 11 destroyers were still in the waters next to the port. Eight submarines were also docked. Elven sailors milled about and tended to their daily duties. Dozens of harpoon missiles streaked through the sky towards the fleet. The first missile smashed into a docked destroyer. The destroyer exploded as destroyer. The de The pier next to it was completely destroyed and the blast wave from the explosions knocked many elves further in the port off of their feet. The naval base alarm blared. Another harpoon missile struck a battleship but did minimal damage. Elves rushed towards the circular sandbag positions that contained AA guns. Orders started being thrown around by multiple officers. Man the AA guns. Load them. Move. Spinning the adjusting wheels, the 88mm AA guns and the 20mm AA quad guns were quickly turned towards the sea where the arrows were seemingly coming from. Black puffs of Magi flak filled all areas of the sky. They had no idea what they were shooting at since they couldn't find what was attacking them but they knew they were being attacked. The harpoon streaked through the skies, unaffected by the Magi flak. Explosions occurred on ships after ships. Inside the large building, not that far from the port, Admiral Ilindar Kelri listened to his adjutant who had just rushed in. Admiral, we are under attack. The human arrows are destroying our ships. How bad is it? We are taking heavy casualties and the anti-aircraft the guns are ineffective. A large explosion shook the building. Tiny bits of the ceiling fell to the floor. Elindar wrinkled his nose. What was that? His adjutant looked around. Um, not sure, sir. The last thing Elindar saw was his adjutant being flung towards him as the building behind the adjutant seemingly disintegrated in a bright flash. Tomahawk cruise missiles flew down onto various parts of the Illysory naval base. Explosions after explosions rocked the area. Elven gunner officers started pointing above. They are coming from above. Adjust the guns. Fire. 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 Some of the AA the guns spun upwards. Suddenly everything in the AA emplacement was flung forward as a tomahawk struck nearby. Some elves stepped out of buildings and onto the road while others peered out from their windows. Afar, they saw smoke rising from where the naval base was. Multiple explosions could also be heard. Concerned murmuring started amongst them. Oh my goddess! What's happening? Port city of Yalin, elven nation. Era ran out of the barrack building. Multiple explosions had jolted her awake. She came onto the street that had a good view of the naval base. What the? Plumes of black smoke rose to the sky from there. 0202 May 14, 2020 CE. 0401 Sun 44, 196 AE. Of Valen, Elven Nation. Anne Falen, the head of the intelligence department, was in Terran's office talking with him. Spying on the humans will be impossible. Any elves we send can't just wear hoods the entire time. It would look too suspicious. 
Can't you find a way to make our ears seem less pointy? Anfalen vigorously shook his head. Even if we cut off a portion of the ear, it won't look correct. An urgent knock came on the door and someone entered without permission. Annoyed at being interrupted, Taryn looked around Anfalen. My leader, this is of utmost importance, you need to evacuate now. The inferiors have launched an attack. Taryn's eyes grew wide. He got his coat and walked into the hallway of his office. Other elves were running around in a panic. Some were carrying important documents or objects while others just rushed for the exit. Anfalen and the messenger followed Taryn out into the hallway. Taryn turned to the messenger. Give me a report right now. What is happening? Taryn started walking towards the exit. We have reports coming in of explosions occurring at the port of Elysary. We have lost contact with multiple of our southern air bases but some of them have sent distress messages. Did the detection stations not detect anything? They were the first things we lost contact with. We tried contacting them around 30 minutes ago and they didn't respond. We thought some communication systems there might have broken. Terran frowned. You fool. Didn't I give explicit orders to inform me of any unusual activities? Although a bit phased at Terran's anger, the messenger stood his ground. My leader, that was only if the detection station reported any unusual activities. Losing contact is unusual enough. They exited the building and walked towards the road. Multiple cars were lined up on that road. Terran walked close to one of the cars with the messenger and Anfalen quickly following. Then a loud boom came from behind them. A blast wave pushed Terran and the others onto the ground. Ugh. Terran groaned at the pain from hitting the ground very hard. Still on the ground, he lifted his head and looked behind him. The messenger and Anfalen, who were behind him, were also lying on the ground. With groans coming from them, they were clearly alive. The building he had just exited was now just rubble. Black smoke rose. If he had been warned a few minutes later, he would have died in there. Elves rushed up to him and lifted him up by the shoulders. My leader, we have to go. Hearing a loud noise coming from the sky, Terran and all the other elves looked up. An extremely fast object flew by overhead. Nace Ankalen Air Base. The rubble shifted. Volman coughed as he hauled himself out of the wreckage of the hangar he was in. Covered in dust, Volman looked around. The runway had been cratered at multiple places. Strewn bits of aircraft laid everywhere. Most buildings were rubble just like the hangar he was in. A couple of minutes later, Jasatha's Mountains. Colonel Haman Yelrick sipped his tea as he studied the blueprints of the EA-196. An aide opened the door without knocking and ran into the office. Colonel, we have reports from command that the capital is under attack. We have received orders to repel the enemy. Haman looked up in a jolt. They were in one of the few buildings that were concealed by the forest of the mountain. A runway ran from inside the mountain to the outside. From a few buildings, elves ran into the mountain. Move them out. Move them out. EA-196's Hexery were pushed out of the mountain opening. The EA-196 was an aircraft with a weird tube under each wing and no propellers. They were quickly pushed onto the runways by the ground crews and their pilots climbed aboard them. A loud whirring sound seemed to come from the tubes as the first one started going down the runway at incredible acceleration. One by one, 87 EA-196s took off. Washington, D.C. Inside the Situation Room, Krilson was giving a briefing to President Hay. We are not exactly sure how their communication systems work so we don't have any airstrike targets pertaining to that. So we have absolutely no capabilities when it comes to destroying their communications. Sadly, yes. Magic is being a major obstacle here. Well, however, compared to the magic in fantasy stories, it doesn't seem that capable. Of Valen, Elven Nation. A convoy of cars sped through the streets of the Elven capital. In one of the cars, Terran looked out the window. In the distance, arrow-like objects flew at seemingly immeasurable speeds. A large explosion rocked where it had just passed. Terran stared at that area. That's the high command office, how do these humans know? Anfalen, who was also in the car with him, answered. 
The humans could have inserted spies among us. How would they have gotten here then? We are on an island far, far away from any human settlement. It would have been obvious too since their ears are not pointy. I don't know, my leader. Terran put his hand to his mouth and sighed through his nose. This is bad. He looked at the front of the car where the messenger and the driver were sitting. Inform those who are still alive that we are beginning operation continued Arrow. The messenger nodded. Also tell the great Magus to flood the city as a last resort. In a field in the elven nation. We got reports of something occurring in the capital. Information is a bit fuzzy though. We are having trouble reaching the high command office. From his entrenched night. Colonel Ronerol Crisbanus looked down at his communication officer. Around him were other Magipanzers, anti-Magipanzer the guns, and trenches with infantry in them. That's concerning. If you receive any orders, tell me immediately. Hearing a weird sound from the sky, Ronerol looked up. Then an explosion blasted his Magipanzer to the side. More and more explosions occurred. Within a few minutes, their entire defensive position was blasted to charred remains. 0213 May 14, 2020 CE. 0406 Sun 44, 196 AE. In the skies over the elven nation. Captain Damon Smith shouted at his men in the MC-130. We are green light. Jump. Go. 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 One by one his men jumped out of the door of the plane. With the last of his men off. Damon jumped out too. The air rushed up towards him as he fell. Below, he could see the parachutes of all the men who had already jumped and the men of the three other MC-130s. Even further below was a large pasture of green. He quickly opened up his parachute and started floating down. Before long he rolled onto the ground. Getting himself out from under the parachute and packing it up, he quickly got to the others. Let's go in the air over the elven nation. Laryl Arakan sat in the cockpit of his EA-196. He had a stern and determined face. He thought back to the last time he had talked with his friend, Eladar. He remembered how excited he was to tell Eladar that he was going to pilot this new aircraft. Turns out, that was the last time he was ever going to talk with him. Laryl only recently learned that the invasion of the Empire has been going disastrously. Most civilians weren't informed and it was treasonous for military personnel to spread this information so Laryl was sure that Eladar's family didn't know that Eladar perished. Now he was going to face the humans that killed his friends. Laryl placed his trust in his new mysterious non-propeller aircraft. A squadron of F-16S went deeper and deeper into elven airspace. Although most of the elven air bases in the northern part of the country have been confirmed to be destroyed, they had to be vigilant for any surprises. Seem to be moving faster than normal elven aircraft. Those are confirmed bandits. You are free to engage. Roger. Fox 3. AIM-120 AMROMs flew forward from the F-16S wings. Chapter 67, Operation Firestorm Part 3. 0221 May 14. 2020 CE. 0410 Sun 44, 196 AE. In the air over the elven nation. The first wave of 18 AMROMs streaked through the sky. It was quickly followed by other waves as the 18 F-16S fired them off one by one. We have reports confirming that the enemy are already there so be ready. The other EA-196 pilots of the first special fighter wing acknowledged Colonel Yelrick over the radio. One of the elven jet pilots noticed something streaking towards them. Each EA-196 started shifting to move in a different direction. Some dived to gain more speed while others banked to the sides. The arrows curved and followed. To the shock of the elves, the arrows got closer and closer. The first arrow hit one of the diving EA-196 which burst into flames. I see no targets. The second wave of arrows appeared as soon as the first wave found all of their targets. The elves completely broke order and focused on avoiding the arrows. Laryl constantly looked back. He cursed as the arrow behind him got closer and closer. Come on. Come on. Faster. He looked behind once more just as the arrow touched the tip of his plane and a bright flash was the last thing he ever saw. 0246 May 14th. 
2020 CE, 0423 Sun 44, 196 A. Afinor Human Concentration Camp, Elven Nation. Pablo nodded to his men as he got off the radio, the birds have flown, take the shots. Although they were in the middle of the forest with foliage surrounding them, a few hundred feet in front was a massive clearing. There were multiple buildings behind a chain-link fence and gate. Whilst everyone else in the team was crouched, their two weapons sergeants were lying on the ground. Frederick aimed down the scope of his M2010 enhanced sniper rifle at one of the sniper towers. The other weapons sergeant, Douglas Brown, also had his M2010 aimed at the other one. All others in the team had their M4 rifles trained on the front gate. Each sniper tower had one elf in them. Two elves stood at the gate. The two elves at the gate were wearing black boots, grey trousers, a grey tunic, and leaf-coloured steel helmet. They were carrying bolt-action rifles. The weapons sergeants slowly adjusted their sniper rifles. Two loud pops echoed through the air. An elven guard looked around. He tapped the shoulder of the other guard beside him. Hmm, did you hear something? I heard a very loud pop. The other guard shrugged. Probably the machinery. I swear it came from the forest. We should go investigate. One of the humans could have escaped. We will be in trouble if we move out of our positions. I guess I will go alert the commander to what I he. Just as he was about to finish his sentence, multiple bullets went through him. A full fusillade of pops could be heard. The other guard did not even have time to process what had just happened in front of him as he was gunned down at nearly the same time. Cease fire. Pablo scanned the entire length of the fence and at the buildings behind the fences. Clear. Let's go. They stood up and sprinted out of the bushes. Running across the flat meadows, it didn't take long for them to get to the gate. They found out that the gate was just a fence that had to be opened by pulling them apart. Pablo and Dennis pulled it open, and they walked into the camp. There was a lone brick building situated just to their right. It was placed right behind the fence and beside the entrance. There was a sign on the left of its door that said in Elven, Guard House. Just to the left of the guard house was a machine gun emplacement surrounded by sandbags that faced into the camp. A few yards further in front of them were a straight row of brick-colored rectangular buildings. There was a road that led from the gate to the rectangular buildings. There also seemed to be a second row somewhat hidden by the first row. Behind the rows of rectangular buildings was a large factory-like structure. We are breaching and clearing each building. Don't shoot any humans. Make sure they have pointy ears. They lined up next to the door of the guard house. Inside the guard house, three guards were talking amongst themselves. The guard house was just a windowless one-room building with two bunk beds on the left and right wall and a desk in the center of the beds on the wall opposite of the door. Two of the guards were sitting on the beds while one was standing in the middle. The elf standing seemed worried. We are closer to the forest. Maybe something happened outside. I don't see why a few pops would be concerning. No one seems to be coming so it should be fine. It was a fusillade of them. I'm just going out to check. He turned around and walked to the door. Just as he was about to open it, the door was opened from the other side and something was thrown in. The metal tube clinked on the ground. The guard stared at it for a bit before realizing what it was. Hmm, grenade. Then a loud flash blinded and deafened them. Pablo burst in and shot the elf that was at the door. Dennis got the one on the right bottom bed while Frederick got the one on the left bottom bed. They looked around the guard house. Clear. After clearing the guard house, Green Berets stealthily moved to the intersection where the entrance road connected with the road that ran between the two rows of one-floor rectangular buildings. They avoided the road and opted to instead walk on the grass. The rectangular buildings hid them from any elves further in the camp. Looking into the windows of the left and right buildings on the entrance road, they saw it was just rows and rows of bunk beds. There was no one inside. The Green Beret team split into two groups and went to the walls of each building. Dennis looked over the corner to scan the left side of the road that ran between the two rows of rectangular buildings while Pablo looked over the corner to scan the right side. 
The sound of factory equipment was getting louder as they got closer. Dennis raised up his hand to show that his side had five elves while Pablo also showed that his side also had five. The elves present were spread out and all seemed to be on patrol. They walked and glanced around randomly. Using hand signals again, Pablo gave some simple commands. Robert, the warrant officer, nodded. Pablo held up three of his fingers and started counting down. The moment his last finger was down, both groups popped out and started shooting. The elves were taken by complete surprise since the camp was located deep inside the elven nation. At first, the ones that hadn't been shot stared in shock at the green berets. By the time they started fumbling for their guns, half of them were already dead. We are under attack. Humans? Hell. The shouting elf was quickly shot in the face. An elf raised his magi rifle and took a shot. The round went way off. He keeled over as a shot went through his stomach. Another shot made a hole in his head. Pablo swept his eyes across the road. The dead elves were strewn around and their blood pooled on the road. The road seems clear. We need to check. A bullet whizzed past him. He felt its force graze his cheek. Fuck. Five elves had just appeared from behind one of the buildings. They seemed to have run here from the factory's direction. Pablo and his team quickly raised their M4S and shot back. Armed with only bolt-action rifles and submachine guns, the elves were simply outgunned by the M4 assault rifles. A couple of panicked shots came from the ones with submachine guns. Soon, the 12-man team of the Green Berets quickly filled the elves of the 5-elf squad with lead. Pablo beckoned Robert over. Robert, you and your team watch our backs, cover the road. We need to look through each building. Got it. Robert nodded and turned to his group. You heard the commander. Pablo turned to his group of six men. We have ten buildings here, look through the windows of each one. Quickly, we made enough sound to alert anybody nearby. A few minutes later, Pablo went to Robert and nodded. All clear. I think these are where they house the prisoners. The signs said human quarters they are completely empty so I'm guessing the people are all in that factory. Not sure why there hasn't been more of a response from the elves but I will take it. Running towards the factory, a rather large two-floor building appeared to the right. It had been hidden by the human quarters. A grey military truck sat nearby on the road. There were also multiple wooden crates sitting next to the truck. They slowed their pace and aimed their guns at the door of the building. A few others kept an eye on the second floor. Two elves sprinted out of the building and left the door open. They had their rifles slung on their backs. One of the elves seemed to have forgotten his helmet while the other didn't have any pants on. With eyes widening, they skidded to a stop at the sight of the Green Berets. Humans are out. The Green Berets quickly dispatched them. Their M4 rifles let loose a series of pops. A hand from inside of the building quickly shot out for the doorknob and slammed the door shut. A barrage of bullets came down on the green berets from the second floor. They quickly hid behind the trucks and wooden crates. Although it seemed to be all rifle shots, the number of bullets from that single barrage was a lot. Pablo guessed that there were no less than 10 to 15 elves in there. That didn't account for those on the first floor. Looking over the crate he was hiding behind, Pablo studied the building. What is this building? Pablo then noticed the sign next to the door. Barracks. He shouted to his men. Seems like there's a lot of them and they are well hunkered down. Miles, think you can sneak over and get a couple C4 onto that side wall? We will distract them. No, scratch that. Miles, how much C4 do you think you can stuff in that backpack of yours? Miles. The engineering sergeant, quizzically looked at Pablo. Won't that alert everyone in this place? We already lost our stealth advantage a long time ago. Pablo and the others started laying down suppressing fire on the building as Miles quickly ran to it. They sporadically popped off a few shots from their M4S. Staying in the blind spots of the windows, Miles stuck multiple C4 onto each wall of the barracks. In a few minutes, he ran over under the cover of the rest of the team's fire. Ready. Miles nodded at Pablo's question. Pablo smiled. Okay, everyone back up a bit further. 
Let's see some fireworks. Pablo clicked the C4 detonator. A blast wave washed over Pablo as the barracks literally exploded in a fiery blast. Dust and smoke obscured their view for a bit before clearing. As the dust settled, only rubble remained where the barrack was. Bits of body parts could be seen in the rubble. Well, that's dealt with. Let's move on to the factory. Multiple bullets whizzed around them. The Green Berets quickly got down onto the ground. Fuck. I'm hit. Chapter 68, Operation Firestorm Part 4. 0322 May 14, 2020 CE. 0441 Sun 44, 196 AE. Afinor Human Concentration Camp, Elven Nation. My leg. Douglas shouted in pain. He laid on the ground like the others but clutched his leg. Pablo and the others quickly got into cover. Douglas dragged himself behind a crate and sat. Frederick looked at where the shots came from. The elves are coming out of the fucking factory. A few elves came out of the doors of the factory and got into cover behind the crates and vehicles there. Flashes came from their bolt-action rifles. Pablo looked over at Douglas. Jeremy, get on Douglas. Everyone else, covering fire. Pablo wished that they had carried the MK-46 machine gun with them on this mission, because they were infiltrating the elves and their bags had been made to look like the ones that an average elf carried, they couldn't bring along any of their larger or bulkier weapons. Every member of the team had an M4 rifle and a varying amount of food and water in their bags, they also all had M9 Berettas hidden on them. From there, what they carried differed. The weapons sergeants had found a way to stuff their sniper rifles into their bags. The medical sergeants had their medical supplies. The communication sergeants had communication equipment. The engineering sergeants had the C4, wire cutters, and a few other random things. Everyone else on the team had grenades and flashbangs. This wasn't everything that they carried but it was a few of the most space-consuming. As Jeremy, the medical sergeant, Crouch ran to Douglas, Pablo focused his fire on one of the elves. A few bullets whizzed over the green berets but the elves were being suppressed by the sheer volume of fire that was being poured down on them. Then multiple bullets peppered the crate where Pablo was hiding. They got a machine gun to our right. Robert yelled to the others. The machine gun started spraying their entire position. Before long though, it fell quiet. Sporadic rifle fire started coming from the elves but without their machine gun, the rest of the green berets could keep the elves mostly suppressed. Pablo peeked out of cover and looked down the scope towards where the machine gun fire was. Although the elf was ducked behind cover while reloading his machine gun, Pablo could see their helmet bobbing up and down. He kept his gun aimed at the area. The elf popped out with his fully reloaded machine gun and set it down. Pablo fired. Watching the elf slump over, Pablo yelled over the gunfire. The machine gunner is down. Dennis looked out of his cover as if he was debating to do something. In a snap, he made up his mind. Keep me covered. I'm moving up. Dennis ran out of cover and started sprinting to a tree. It was quite a distance and a few of the elves noticed. They tried to take Dennis out but they were completely pinned down. Dennis lobbed a grenade at the elves' position. Inside the factory, an elf ran into a room that looked like an office. The elf officer, Lieutenant Alok Rolina, was at a desk and writing something on paper. The officer looked up at the panicked soldier. Lieutenant, the factory is under attack by armed human soldiers. Come down. Alert the elves in the barracks. The soldier looked down at his feet and started stammering. They, they are all dead. Alok raised his right eyebrow. What do you mean they are all dead? There were at least 30 elves in there. The humans blew up the entire barrack. Alok took a deep breath. He wanted to scream and question how the humans were able to blow up that big of a barrack but he understood that he was in a bad situation. How many elves do we have left? About 10. A few of them are already engaging the humans outside. What do we do sir? Call a retreat. Get me out of here. We will use the back door. What do we do about the humans? Alok paused as an explosion came from outside. Leave them, 
The remaining elves panickedly shouted after Dennis's grenade killed a few of them. They started running back into the factory. Pablo took a shot and nailed an elf, who was standing up to run, in the head. One of the elves seemingly dropped his rifle as he ran back inside. Pablo turned to Jeremy who was still tending to Douglas. How's Douglas? I patched his leg up and gave him some morphine. He should be fine. He can still walk. Pablo looked over Jeremy's shoulder and at Douglas. Douglas, your leg holding up. Douglas nodded. Yeah, I'm fine. A little pain like this is nothing. Jeremy stared at Pablo's shoulder. Pablo looked at Jeremy questionably. What? Pablo, you are bleeding from the right shoulder. Ah shit, said Pablo as he touched his right shoulder. Ouch, I didn't notice it at all. Let me patch that up for you. Quickly the Green Berets moved up to the factory. They got beside the door that the elves all ran into. Dennis was in the lead and looked back to the others. I don't know how many of them are in there but there's at least three from the survivors. Dennis opened the door and threw in a flashbang. Hearing it go off, the team rushed in. For the nation. An elf lunged at Dennis with a knife. Avoiding the knife, Dennis grabbed the elf by the neck and then went around him. He got both of his arms under the elf's armpit. Dennis locked his hands on the elf's neck. The elf struggled intensely to get out of Dennis's hold and kicked around. The elf started wildly shooting tiny fireballs. The fireballs fizzled out in a very short distance but it would be dangerous to Dennis if the elf somehow got his hand around. Dennis ground his teeth. What the fuck? Shoot him. Blood splattered over Dennis's face as a bullet from Pablo's M9 Beretta entered the side of the elf's head. Letting go, the elf crumpled to the floor, blood flowing out of his brain. Dennis wiped his face. Motherfucker. Moving further into the factory, the Green Berets scanned around. They saw a couple of figures crouching behind some machinery. Dennis approached them with his finger on the trigger. The four men looked at Dennis in fear. Noticing that they didn't have pointy ears, Dennis relaxed and held his hand up to the others. Don't fire, they are all humans. Dennis studied the men. They all seemed to be in their mid-twenties. Remembering the imperial language, Dennis spoke to them. Don't worry. I'm human. See. Dennis pointed to his ears. The men, noticing this, all blinked in surprise. Joy soon came across their faces. One of them seemingly threw themselves onto the ground as if in prayer. Another one started crying. Thank angels. We are saved. Hearing the happy shouts, more and more figures started showing themselves. Some came out of closet doors and others stood up from the machinery and tables they were hiding behind. They were all human men and seemingly varied from as young as 16 to as old as around 40. Dennis looked around. Okay, listen up. You are all humans right? Albeit all looking nervous, the people in the room nodded. Do any of you know where the elves went? The men looked at each other. One of them responded. I don't know. They seemingly disappeared after the gunfire and explosion. We thought they were killing everyone so we decided to hide. Dennis nodded. Thank you. You are safe buddy. We will get all of you guys out of here. Who are you people? One of the men cautiously inquired. We are American Special Forces. We have been tasked to liberate you guys, said Dennis. Please refrain from any more questions. We have to get you guys out of here. The elves could come back with reinforcements. We will be linking up with a bigger force. 0220 May 14th. 2020 CE 0410 Sun 44th 196 AE 3 miles from the Orva Sialara human concentration camp Elven Nation Damon and the rest of Baker Company of the 75th Ranger Regiment had quickly collected the extra supplies that the MC130 had also parachuted out They were now traveling hastily across the green pastures Second platoon was sent further ahead for reconnaissance about an hour later. This is Ghost 2. We have found the concentration camp. Quite a big place. Over. I hear you loud and clear. Is the only elf presence at the camp? Over. We have only seen them at the camp. The route there is clear. But there are a lot of them in the camp. 
At least a company's worth. Over. Okay. Stand by. We will arrive within six minutes. Over and out. Damon got off of his radio. He turned to First Lieutenant Jeb Baker, the executive officer of Baker Company. Seems like they accidentally dropped us off about a mile from our supposed drop-off place. Ghost 2 just found where the concentration camp was. It's further than it's supposed to be. Orvis Ayalara Human Concentration Camp, Elven Nation. Senior Lieutenant Kaylin Jondon saluted as she entered Captain Elian Winery's office. Captain, we have received reports that a human invasion has begun. Start rounding the humans up, said Elian, frowning at the news. He got out and flipped through a book. Protocol indicates that we need to start exterminating the prisoners. Five minutes later, Damon was lying on the grass and observing the concentration camp when a gunshot rang out from the camp's direction. Fuck. They are executing the prisoners. Damon got on his radio. This is ghost actual. Are you guys in position? Over. We are in place. Ready to take the shots. Over. Good. Do not fire yet. Over and out. Damon turned to the others. The gate is quite sturdy. There are multiple guards and a guard post right outside. Get the Carl Gustav and blow that entrance and post up. Two soldiers aimed down the scope of their Carl Gustavs. Back blast area clear. Firing. One HEDP, high explosive dual purpose, round streaked towards the guard post while the other HEDP round streaked towards the gate. A bright orange explosion knocked the guards off their feet and made a hole in the gate while another explosion shaved off half of the guard post. This is ghost actual. You are free to fire at any elves. Focus fire on those responding to that explosion. Over. Wilco. Over and out. The 50 men from the 4th platoon swiftly moved toward the gate. Elves showed up from the clearing dust. MK-48 machine guns opened up on the elves at the blown-up gate. One of the snipers looked down the scope of his M-2010. He led on the head of an elf running towards the gate. He pressed the trigger and the gun jerked. Moving his gun, he found another target. He fired again. Damon watched as the men of 4th platoon took cover behind the debris and objects at the gate. They started pouring down fire. Ghost 2. Ghost 3. We are moving up to Ghost 4's position. Disorganized squads of elves tried to respond. Taking cover behind crates, buildings, and vehicles, the elves opened up with machine gun and rifle fire. The 4th platoon responded in kind but with a higher volume of firepower. They started pushing into the camp. Soon the rest of Baker Company joined in. The front gate is secure. We got a couple injured. We are clearing the buildings near the entrance. While supervising the extermination in an open field in the camp, Elian heard the explosions and gunshots at the gate. He went to find Kaylin. Lieutenant. Report? What's happening at the front gate? Kaylin was talking to the company sergeant major but directed her attention to Elian. Human infantry have begun an assault. They have taken over the gate. Get the armored cars out and deal with them. Chapter 69, Operation Firestorm Part 5, 0343 May 14, 2020 CE, 0451 Sun 44, 196 AE, Orvis Ayalara Human Concentration Camp, Elven Nation. The firefight continued at the front gate as squads of elves tried to push the humans out. Although the elves held a choke point and the camp garrison had nearly equal numbers to the human company attacking them, their unpreparedness caused them to be outnumbered 10 to 1 at the front gate. Pull back, pull back, pull back. The elves started rushing out of their position. Crouching behind the debris, barrels, and creates, the rangers continued pouring fire from their M4 rifles and MK-48 machine guns. A few elves fell face forward as they ran. A couple slumped to the side after being shot by the snipers. The firefight died down as the elves retreated further into the camp. Behind them, the fourth platoon was clearing the buildings. Multiple shots came out of a one-floor square building. One of the soldiers from the fourth platoon chucked a grenade into the window. An explosion rocked the ground. Multiple rangers burst in, 
Weapons at the ready. Three elves laid on the floor, killed by the grenade. This is Ghost 4, we have secured the surrounding buildings. Area in front of the front gate is secure. While advancing forward, opposition from the elves came back faster than expected. Elven machine guns opened up and a barrage of fire came down on the rangers. The retreating elves seemed to have done a 180 and started rushing back towards them. It was soon clear why. Two grey armoured cars moved down the road towards them. An elven officer raised his pistol in the air and waved it forwards. Attack! Attack! Crush the inferiors! In the storm of the lead laid down by the rangers, two heat, high explosive anti-tank, rounds from the Carl Gustav struck the two armoured cars. The cars exploded and veered off the road. Although the rangers were still shooting, the elves seemed to be in a state of shock. Once again, the elves started retreating. This time, they were much more panicked. Pull back, pull back. Elian couldn't believe his ears. They took out both armored cars. Kaelin nodded. They have some sort of weapon with the ability to destroy armor. Tell all units to regroup near the center of the camp. Sporadic firefights occurred as the rangers advanced further into the camp. Groups of elves hid in the buildings and behind cover. The rangers had taken some casualties but the elves were clearly losing. Moreover, in the midst of the chaotic battle, some of the prisoners were able to get to the rangers. We spotted a large force of elves blocking the road in front of you. Permission to fire. Hold fire. Thanks for the tip, Ghost Sierra. While the fourth platoon swept the area behind them for any hiding elves and helped the prisoners, first, second, and third moved up. One of the platoon leaders hid behind a wall. He jabbed his thumb behind him as he talked to his grenadiers. They should be right over there. Hiding behind those crates and overturned tables. Got it, sir. Multiple 40mm grenades shot out of the M203 grenade launchers mounted under the grenadier's M4. The elves' position was smashed open by the barrage of high-explosive grenades. A few of the elves survived but were heavily disoriented. The rangers opened up. A few minutes later, they have easily broken through the first two lines of defense. Elian crossed his arms at the news. He stood still outside of his office as his soldiers rounded up the humans that had not escaped or killed and got ready to execute them. He turned to look towards where the human soldiers were supposedly coming from. Suddenly a bullet whizzed past him and hit the ground. What the? Captain? Get inside. Kalen urged him into his office. Inside, Elian had a frown on his face. Great. Now, we have snipers. He opened the curtains of the window. Since the shot came from the side that faced the back of his office, he wasn't concerned about getting shot from his window. He watched as his men hid behind whatever they could find or buildings they could get in. Then the humans in the field started running. Shoot the running humans. Shots further into the camp were heard. Damon grew concerned as it didn't seem that the shots were anywhere near where his men were. The prisoners are trying to run but they are getting shot at by the elves. We are trying to kill those shooting. How far away is it? One ST platoon will be there soon. Ghost 1. This is ghost actual. Get your asses moving? The damn elves are killing the prisoners. The shooting outside of Elian's office got louder and louder. It wasn't from his soldiers killing the prisoners but the battle against the assaulting humans. Captain. Most of the humans have either escaped or been killed. We need to relocate. If we hug the walls, we can avoid the snipers. Get one of the Majoradio Elf and tell them to start an organized retreat. A figure walked up the street towards a squad from the second platoon. The rangers aimed their guns. Hold fire? It's a person. At that. They lowered their guns. A soldier of the 4th platoon kicked the door open. He swept his eyes and gun around the entire room and noticed a cowering figure. Looking closely, the figure didn't have pointy ears. Watching from an elevated position, the sniper teams watched as most of the elves started retreating. Some of the elves stayed back and continued fighting. This is Ghost Sierra. The elves are performing an organized retreat. Damon nodded. Ghost 3. This is Ghost Actual, 
I want you guys to disengage and focus on one spot. Ghost 2 on the left flank and Ghost 3 on the right flank. Try to create a corridor in their lines where you can go through. The elves are doing an organized retreat. I want you to cut them off. Wilco. Understood. Ghost 1. This is Ghost Actual. Take over Ghost 2 and 3's position. There should be fewer elves now. Elian huffed a bit as he rested. Elian, Kaelin, and around 30 of his elves were scattered on the other side of the camp. Elian shook his head. We can't hold this camp. I have requested reinforcements but the closest unit is a couple of hours away. Shots rang out. Kaelin looked alarmed. She beckoned over a Majoradio elf and started contacting the platoon commanders. After a short conversation over the Magi radio, she went over to Elian. They were able to get through the ones covering us. The sound of the shots got louder and closer. Captain, we need to get into a building, said Kaelin. She also called over a handful of the soldiers nearby. We will take up a position in that building. Elian went up to the second floor with Kaelin and a couple of soldiers following. One of the soldiers looked out the window at the firefight. He looked back at Elian. Captain, what do we do? They are getting closer. Elian considered the question before looking at Kaelin. Kaelin, can we retreat? We should but we may not have a safe route to do so. The soldier looking out the window spoke up again. Captain, some of the soldiers outside are surrendering. Elian's eyes lit up. The humans. No, ours. Outside, one by one, the elves started throwing down their weapons and raising their hands. When the second and third platoon penetrated the already weakened elven covering force, the covering force was thrown into disarray and started surrendering. This caused more and more elves to do so too. Before long, the rangers secured the entire camp and killed off the last of the ones still resisting. A few hours later, the rangers guarding the front gate readied their weapons as multiple figures appeared on a road. One of the rangers squinted at the figures before shouting, It's the Green Berets that are supposed to link up with us. A few minutes later, Pablo greeted Damon. Damon replied in a joking manner, What took you so long? You missed our battle. Pablo laughed. Trust me, we had our own battle. Well, I can see that. 0400 May 14, 2020 CE. 0500 Sun 44, 196 AE. In the air over the elven nation. Formations of F-15S and F-16S swooped down low. Their speed made them almost unhittable by the elven air defense. Off in the distance, black smoke rose from burning metal. Multiple B-1Bs dropped their payloads onto large elven coastal fortifications. 20 B-52S cruised at nearly 50,000 feet. Although they were all in different locations, they were all moving south and deeper into elf territory. Northern Sector Elven Detection Station. An elven operator gave an emergency report. We have detected multiple aircraft scattered by themselves in the air across our sector. They all entered from the south where the humans are attacking. The commanding officer nodded. Alert all air bases in the northern sector to respond. Twenty squadrons of EA-192S took off from multiple different air bases scattered across the northern sector. Each headed straight for one of the detected aircraft. In the air. The weather in the northern sector was extremely clear and it was easy to see for miles. One of the ELF pilots noticed a single aircraft. It seemed so small because of how high above them it was. The elves easily identified it as a heavy bomber but were mystified as to how it flew since it didn't have propellers on its wings. The 12 EA-192S started to climb towards it. Within a few minutes of climbing, their engines started cutting out and they stalled. They had barely reached their target. The EA-192S curved backward and started falling. Falling for a bit, they regained control. How high is it? Regroup and attack again. We will have to shoot before we stall. Again, they tried. They aimed their aircraft at the human bomber and quickly climbed to intercept it. When the pilots felt that they were about to stall, they opened fire. Even with the EA-192S reaching their maximum ceiling of around 39,000 feet, 
their bullets couldn't reach the lone human bomber cruising slowly through the sky as if it was mocking them. Each squadron of 12 EA-192S was unable to engage the B-52S that they had been tasked to destroy. The B-52S continued on their journey. Chapter 70, Operatio and Firestorm Part 6 In the air near the center of the Elven Nation, Aircraft Commander Evan Matthews glanced out the window of his B-52. Green mountains were seemingly spread across the land. Propeller aircraft darted back and forth below them. His co-pilot, Evan Smith, chuckled. I think tree huggers are a better name. Well, they don't hug trees as far as I have heard. Further inside the B-52, Jairis Barnett, the radar navigator, whistled into his microphone as he looked at his video camera. Those look exactly like those Nazi fighters my grandpa told me about. Just look at them. Never thought I would see one shooting their guns. Oh look, they are stalling. Their B-52, laden with nearly 70,000 pounds of bombs, lumbered on through the sky as the EA-192S gave chase down below. Northern Sector Detection Station, Elven Nation. Based on their trajectory, they are going directly to all southern airfields. There's also one headed for our station. Senior Lieutenant Ivasar Fiwaran rubbed his chin at the words of Lieutenant Alok Yestin who was standing in front of his desk. And all the EA-192 squadrons that have been sent out can't shoot them down. Alok nodded. Yes. All airbases are reporting that the EA-192S don't have the altitude. So there's one that's headed to our station and it's a heavy bomber. Alok nodded again. Yes, sir. Get this to high command. Ivasar stood up. As for us, we are evacuating. Get all the important documents. Tell everyone to pack up. Alok turned to leave but stopped himself. Um, sir, we already lost contact with high command. Oh, forgot about that. Then switch to northern subcommand. Ivasar went to grab a few files from the drawers behind him. Not hearing his door close, he looked back. Why are you just standing there? Alok rubbed his neck. Sir, ah, uh, how do we contact them? With a mildly surprised expression, Ivasar asked, You are telling me that we have never contacted them before in our many drills even though this region is under their control. Well, sir, this was not in expectation with any of our military drills. It was assumed that the high command office would always be available. Just alert all airbases first. I should be able to find the number to call them. Imithmal Air Base, Elven Nation. The 55th Squadron failed to shoot down the enemy aircraft, said Lieutenant Colonel Goran Erdaris while saluting. Colonel Vieral Quicken showed his clear unhappiness at the news. What? How? It's only a single aircraft. The aircraft is flying higher than any of our aircraft can. Vieral raised his eyebrows. This is ridiculous. We got reports from our detection station that one of the aircraft, which has been identified as a heavy bomber, is headed straight for us. It's only one bomber right? Goran gave a curt nod. Yes. Vieral gave it a few minutes of thought before explaining his thinking to Goran. It shouldn't be able to destroy that much of the base. Tell all pilots to start evacuating by taking off with their aircraft. Tell other personnel to take what's important and start leaving the base. We will all return once the bombing is over. Hopefully, the runways will still be operational or fixable after that bombing. Most of them should. It's only one bomber that probably is carrying very light bombs. No more than 10,000 pounds probably. Coupled with the fact that the accuracy of bombers isn't that good either. Our airfield shouldn't be that badly damaged. Goran showed a bit of uncertainty. Sir, how are you so sure about the weight? Remember the cancelled prototype that we had? The RA-177 heavy bomber? It could only carry around 15,000 pounds of bombs. And it couldn't even fly higher than our fighter aircraft. I'm somewhat overestimating seeing how the humans have their bomber so high. I guess 5,000 to 10,000 pounds would be a good guess. A few minutes later. EA-192S and RA-189S started taking off from the runways. More aircraft were wheeled out from the hangars and pilots got into them. 
Elves ran in and out of buildings carrying papers, boxes, tools, and various other things. They loaded them into cars and trucks, watched as his aides loaded up the officer car with important documents. Vieral's head turned to follow the last airplane, an EA-192, as it sped down the runway. He looked at his driver before stepping into the officer car. Follow the convoy out. Ten minutes later, in the air, Jairi stared at the video feed of the ground below. I only see a couple down there and they are quite abandoned. Evan chuckled over the radio. In massive clusters, MK-82 500-pound and MK-84 2,000-pound bombs started falling out from underneath the B-52. Explosions rocked the elven airfield below as massive plumes of black smoke rose from wherever the bombs hit. A few miles from the Imithmal Air Base, Vieril stepped out of his car and looked through the trees of the forest. He could see black smoke rising towards the sky. He walked back towards the car. Start turning around. Contact all units, and tell them to start returning to base. What is this? Our planes can't land now. Once they returned, the airfield was barely recognizable. What used to be runways were now blackened ground filled with craters of various sizes. The barracks and hangars were now a pile of metal and wood strewn around. An EA-192 circled overhead. The pilot, Vorin Genjor, looked over at the ground and wondered how he was supposed to land. Vieral stared at the ground of the airbase before looking up and saying, they are going to need to find elsewhere to land. Goran, who was right beside him, grew concerned. Where else though? Other than this clearing, it's all mostly forest around here. Are we able to contact any other airbase near us? We do have a Magi radio. I will try contacting the other bases. A few minutes later, Goran shook his head when he returned to Vieral's side. I can't reach any of the other bases. Now a mixture of EA-192S and RA-189S were circling overhead. Vieral became quiet for a few seconds before saying, How long do you think we can make a suitable runway? Goran looked around and towards all the soldiers that had returned. Their vehicles parked around what used to be the airbase. We don't have any construction equipment and having the men dig a suitable dirt runway will take a while because of these massive craters. Then get them to work. This is probably the only way to get these planes to land safely, because they were filled to the brim with bombs and were flying at their maximum altitude, the B-52S combat range was significantly reduced. However, the total distance from the northern tip of the elven nation was around only 15% of the B-52S total unfueled combat range. They were easily able to continue their journey back to their air bases in the Magus Imperium. Vorin watched from his EA-192 as the elves on the ground scurried around the bombed airfield. They were clearly trying to clear a way so the planes could land. He looked at his magic gauge. It was nearly 80% empty. He was going to have to land soon. Twenty minutes later, he watched as a different EA-192 attempted to perform a landing on one of the narrow roads through the forest. It got closer and closer to the ground while tilting to avoid the trees. It seemed to be doing well until the plane veered a bit to the right. Its right wing struck one of the trees of the forest. The right wing came right off and the aircraft spiraled out of control. The EA-192 disappeared from his view before a loud explosion could be heard. Smoke rose from somewhere in the forest. A few more aircraft tried to land on the dirt roads or small clearings in the forest in the next hour. A couple even tried to land in the rivers that flowed across the forests. Some of the pilots survived but all their planes were completely destroyed. The soldiers trying to repair the airfield were unlikely to finish on time. Vorin looked at his magic gauge once more. The magic was completely out. He had even exhausted all his magic when he poured it into the aircraft. He had no confidence that he would be able to survive a crash landing. Pressing a button, he ejected from his EA-192. He quickly deployed his parachute and floated down. A few other pilots followed his example and ejected from their planes. Vorin sat on the ground next to one of the trucks near the airbase. He watched as soldiers ran around trying to even out the runway. He looked up at the sky and watched the remaining planes. 
It wasn't long before something caught his eye. An RA-189 started lining up on the still unfixed runway. It passed over the soldiers doing the fixing. Its propellers blew wind across the ground. It made a hard bank to the right and circled around. It started flying lower and lower. The soldiers on the runway shouted and started running out of the way. The plane's wheels touched the blackened dirt and started running down the destroyed runway. It wasn't long before it hit a crater at very fast speeds and flipped over. The pilot, slightly injured, dragged himself out from under the plane. With the runway unable to be repaired and landing in the heavily forested area nearly impossible, most of the pilots just abandoned their planes and parachuted out. Similar things occurred across the north, as all airfields in the northern sector had been bumped to oblivion. Unlike the south with sparse forests and many plains, the north was full of forests. A large mountain range divided the north from the south. Although personnel casualties were low, the loss of most of the planes that had been held in reserve in the northern sector had a severe cost. Somewhere in the elven nation, Terran sat down in a chair in his new office room. He turned his head from left to right and looked at the surviving generals. Give me a detailed report of everything that has gone on. The generals glanced at each other. Field Marshal Agord Gale, who had not been in the high command office when it was bombed, responded, that will be extremely difficult, my leader. It's complete chaos now. We are getting reports of attacks everywhere. It seems to be mostly from the air. Just give me everything you are able to find out. In the sea less than 20 miles from the elven nation. Nick played a game of poker with his tank crew. We should be there quite soon. Let's finish this game up and get ready. Beaches of the Magus Imperium. Isaac boarded his transport ship along with the rest of his unit. He stretched while staring out at the glittering sea.